It was 4 a.m. when the printer spat out my essay. I reread it, second guessing my last line. Thus, Miller and Salinger, through Abigail and Holden, prove that lying and breaking the rules is a dangerous but essential part of growing up. Not a great conclusion, but it was the best I could do. I passed out on the couch. Wake up, my mom said two hours later. Did you finish your paper? I held up the five-page, double-spaced, 12-point, Times New Roman font, neatly stapled homework assignment, outlining the similarities and differences between Holden Caulfield and Abigail Williams. I took a perverse sense of pride in skirting deadlines, because inspiration and last-minute panic often felt like the same thing. <laughs> By 11th grade, I figured English papers, science projects, and cramming for AP classes were not worth it unless I pulled an all-nighter. And for me, it was an honor. See, in my high school, there were about 20 kids who found themselves in the tacitly agreed upon social strata known as the AP bubble. These students were, in the, were, in, were within the top 10% of the class. They only took advanced placement classes. They were destined for the Ivy League and schools that ended in tech. <laughs> What's worse is they didn't even seem nerdy. When they talked about obscure pop culture, it wasn't video games, TV shows, and comic books. It was indie movies and underground LA bands they saw at the Troubadour. They were nerdy hipsters without the pretension. They only dated within the bubble, as though they were trying to produce a race of intellectually superior offspring who would kindly and beneficently subjugate us all. <laughs> I wanted to be part of the bubble, but was hamstrung by my lack of knowledge in regards to anything that required numbers, sequencing, or formulas. Because I took AP language, I was bubble adjacent. Thus, these last-minute paper writing sessions became one of my few peeks into their world. We would constantly message each other back and forth, using AIM like a lifeline while the rest of the world, i.e. our parents, slept. It was community, companionship, and it made me feel like I was better than I really was. You're going to school, right? Said my mom. Yeah, I said. Okay. As she left, she added, don't forget your phone. How could I forget my phone? There it is. Um, I was one of the first of my friends to have my blue Nokia brick with its two-tone screen and sweet, sweet snake game. <laughs> that phone was solid, dependable, with a charge that lasted 18 hours and never dropped calls. As such, when my mom said, don't forget your phone, what she really meant was, don't forget the rule. And the rule was, when she calls, no matter what I'm doing, no matter who I'm with, no matter what is going on, I must answer. I hated the rule. It turned the phone into this digital leash. Bleary-eyed and sluggish, I hopped into my truck and went to pick up my best friend, another bubble-adjacent guy, Ryan. Yo, he said, hopping in. You get your paper done? Yeah, I said, finished around 4 a.m. You? Ryan laughed. He had started his a week ago. Dude, I watched Smallville, listened to Death Cab, and then wrote my conclusion in bed by 10. <laughs> I thought you seemed chipper, I said. Dude, time management? I can't help but if I budget like a motherfucker. <laughs> Whatever. Ah, someone's cranky. Whatever. As we pulled into the parking lot, he said, we're going to Chris's for Jedi Outcast after school, right? I sighed. Yeah, I'll be there. Another Friday night of video games and late night cable at a friend's house. I didn't even like video games. I wondered what the bubble was doing. Probably doing something awesome and hip, like watching Itu Mama Tambien. <laughs> the day wore on. I wrote something impressive in my non-AP history class and the teacher liked it. I stayed quiet on AP Lang because I hadn't understood the Tom Wolfe essay we read. I dozed here and there, my all-nighter slowly sapping my reserve energy. We went to Chris's house after school. They played video games while I slept on his couch. When I woke up, it was dark outside. Dude, said Ryan, your phone's been buzzing like crazy. I checked my Nokia. Three missed calls from my mom. Oh, shit, I should call her back, I said. But as I stood up, I noticed Chris was missing. Dude, where's Chris? Ryan didn't look up from the screen. Uh, I think he went to change. 
Change? For what? I don't know, a party or something? What? What? He was invited to a party? What the fuck? And he's not taking us? Chris reached the bottom of the stairs. It's not a real party, he explained. It's a robotics thing. Ah, robotics club. If ever there was another way to become bubble adjacent, it was through the robotics club. <laughs> Chris and I were on opposite ends of the spectrum. I could English and he could science. Chris continued, it's just a barbecue. I had an idea. It may have been a stupid idea, but it was an idea. I realized this was not just a barbecue. This was an opportunity. Dude, take us. The sound effects of laser blasts and physical anguish from the TV ceased when Ryan put his controller down. Wait, are we talking about crashing? Solid question. Debate. Crashing pros and cons. <laughs> On the one hand, no, we weren't because A, it wasn't really a party. It was more of a get together. And B, as bubble adjacent errs, we knew everyone who was going to be there. I mean, we never really officially hung out with them outside of school, but we knew them, right? And that meant it wouldn't be weird. On the other hand, it might be weird. <laughs> All right, okay, look, I said, how about this? I'll take my truck, and if we're turned away, that's fine. Ryan and I will leave, and that's that. If we don't, if we're not, then we'll stay. Chris looked at us in the same way I would. He had an explicit albeit obligatory invitation to a bubble event. Would he, could he risk it by dragging us up the social spectrum? Ugh, he said, fine. My, I felt my phone buzz again in my pocket, but I ignored it. I was too happy to think about anything else. This was going to be the best Friday night ever. In the truck, Ryan asked a valid question. Why are you breathing so hard? Fuck, he was right. I was legitimately nervous to do this. <laughs> Part of my anxious brain was hoping we'd be turned away at the door so we could go back to scouring Blockbuster for American Pie 2 or something. <laughs> we arrived, parked, and stood at the bottom of the walk. Jesus, dude, seriously, stop breathing so hard, <laughs> Ryan said. Got it? Yep, good call. Chris knocked. Someone's mom answered. Moment of truth. Oh, hey, guys, come on in. Everyone's in the back. Holy fucking shit. I really can't stress enough how much this wasn't a party. There were no red cups. Nobody was there cheating on another person. Everyone wore jeans and a button up, including the girls. But this was still to me amazing because A, there were girls and B, it was the bubble kids sitting around a patio just generally exuding an air of sophistication and confidence and C, there were girls. <laughs> My anxiety melted away. The bubble didn't know how exclusive their little get-togethers were. They welcomed us. They laughed at our jokes, and we all agreed the next Lord of the Rings movie was going to be amazing. Someone said, someone, had, someone said they heard that if you heat up Kraft cheese singles, it creates some sort of like chemical reaction, and the plastic functions as a sealant, thus creating like a cheese balloon. This fascinated us, and we tried it on the barbecue. Yes, the bubblers were trying to create a literal bubble. <laughs> the whole time, uh, I didn't feel my phone buzz at all, except, except yes, I did. And I knew who it was. This was a bubble non-party event thing. How could I answer it? Everything had worked out. Crashing had been a great idea. We had succeeded. We were one step closer to being part of the bubble. But the thing about bubbles is they burst. After about an hour or so, the host's mom came out. She whispered to someone. That someone pointed to me. The host's mom called to me loudly and in front of everyone. Hey, your mom is here. <laughs> Motherfucking burst. I slinked through the house, and there she was, still in her work clothes, arms folded, face frozen, and that mom look of, kid, I would fucking curb stomp you right now if it were legal. Uh, hey, mom, I said, go to the car. I, I have the truck. It's not an invitation, it's a summons. So while I was having this fun little adventure, here's what was going on with my mom. She left for work and told her colleagues how proud she was that I was such a hard worker. She wanted to call me and tell me so, but I was in school. At 3.45, she called me the first time. I didn't pick up. 
She didn't think anything of it. At 4.05, she remembered I'd pulled an all-nighter. She was plagued by visions that I'd fallen asleep behind the wheel and been horribly mangled in a wreck. She called again, and again. I didn't answer. This only elevated her in anxiety. She decided to take matters into her own hands. She called Chris's mom, who did answer. Chris's mom confirmed that indeed I am alive, but am, in fact, a shitty son who had broken the always answer rule multiple times. Chris's mom gave her the address of the thing. She drove over. She sat in her car for 20 minutes trying to calm down, trying to convince herself that I was not shitty. So she decided to call me one more time. Had I answered even that last time, everything would have been fine. But I did not. When we got home, I went to my room with my, mo with my mom promising we would talk about it tomorrow. As I passed the computer, I looked at that last line again. Thus, Miller and Salinger, through Abigail and Holden, prove that lying and breaking the rules is a dangerous but essential part of growing up. Huh. Guess I was right. Thank you so much.